in the shadows of the deepest dungeons. There is a secret cabal. The web of intrigue leads to every corner of the world. And soon, they will take over and lead from their shadowy lands. Yes, that is a perfect intrigue plot. Now my readers will surely be amazed by this 200 IQ plot. James think to himself, unaware that he just repeated a well-known trope. But then, George R. R. Martin arises from his deep slumber in the mountains. He senses a cheap and bad intrigue, and so he rushes to James to push some depth to his dark intrigues. He knows how to do it as he proved many times with his nuanced political plots. His books now became a bible for James to follow, showing him the secrets of creating political intrigues. But to even start to write good intrigues, you need to know what intrigues are. In a simple and short answer, intrigues are a making of and execution of a plan to do something that will harm or deceive someone. Intrigues can be made by a single person, but they very often are made by a group of people, a faction if you like. A faction can be very often created for this specific reason, to form an intrigue against someone or something. That is why I started with a video guide for factions first in this mini-series about worldbuilding politics. Now, what really distinguishes intrigues from a regular plan to do something is the fact that it needs to be secretive. The goal of the intrigue needs to be something that is otherwise punishable or reprehensible in terms of law or public eye, and can bring a lot of negative attention to the people who organize that intrigue. And because of that, there needs to be a lot to be gained from said intrigue to offset the big risk that comes with it. For example, killing a king is a huge risk, and I'm not even talking about attempting to do so. Even if the king is not liked, being seen as a kingslayer can have a lot of negative impact and can give an excuse to depose someone if that person took part in this intrigue. There needs to be a lot of benefits to be gained to even start convincing other people to help you in this endeavor. Because what if you don't like the king, you think he's immoral and a drunkard, but his power and authority holds a lot of stability in your kingdom, and his death would cause a lot of cascading events that can lead to civil unrest, internal wars, and other negative consequences. What if this king was the only thing keeping the neighboring kingdoms in check, and he was able to hold peace with them? If you've ever watched or read Game of Thrones, you might know what I am talking about. Game of Thrones is a genius example on how it used to, before the 8th season, show complex political intrigues. In Game of Thrones, the Kingdom of Westeros was ruled by House Targaryen, a family that used to hold the crown for many centuries, but because of a certain Mad King, a rebellion against the crown was born. The Mad King was overthrown, and Robert Baratheon, one of the nobles that started the rebellion, took the crown. Now, Robert at one point dies because of an accident during a hunt. Robert Baratheon was a drunkard, he was a glutton, and we see in the show that he is a man who is capable of slapping his own wife if he feels insulted. And yet, there was no intrigue to dispose of Robert, because all of those flaws were almost nothing compared to the fact that he was keeping stability after the death of the previous king. He rewarded his allies well and kept good relationships with noble houses. Westeros was a stable kingdom under his rule in spite of his many flaws. But then came Joffrey Baratheon, Robert's son, who was young, inexperienced, very emotional, extremely arrogant, pretty dumb, a coward who no one respected, and a petty, sadistic brutal. He was constantly making decisions that were selfish, emotional, and was harming the relations between the crown and all the noble houses. He was also very hard to control, as he wanted to be constantly seen as a great king. And Joffrey didn't manage to rule that long, because an intrigue was instantly born to remove him from power. There was a lot to be gained by removing such a chaotic, unstable, incompetent person from the throne, especially that his younger brother, who was supposed to take this crown after Joffrey, was much more timid and kind, very docile and easy to control. 
And then there was Jaime, a personal guard of the Mad King, who was overthrown. Jaime killed the Mad King himself and helped the rebellion, but because he did that so openly, his reputation was forever stained. Yes, he helped the current king and killed the previous one who wanted to detonate the city, and by doing so, he saved a lot of lives, but he killed the man who he was supposed to protect. He killed the king, unlawfully, breaking his oath to defend him, and so his reputation was forever stained. If he would conspire to make an intrigue against him and kill him secretly, his reputation would never be so stained. Of course, killing a king is a big deal, but intrigues can form for many reasons, and they don't need to be aimed to kill someone or harm someone. Intrigues can be born out of willingness to change something for the better. You can absolutely have an intrigue that is not hostile. Maybe you want to help someone, but you know, doing that openly will not be very effective, so you need to you know, go into the subterfuge. Maybe there is a prince who wants his father to be no longer the king, not because he hates him or he's vile, but, you know, he's old, he's not very effective anymore, and his health is deteriorating under the stress of, you know, being the ruler of the kingdom. So, you know, the prince, who really care about his father, just want him to go into retirement, not out of spite, but because he cares for his kingdom and for his father, whose health will vastly improve if he is no longer in charge. So, how do you begin? First, you need to realize if there is a fertile ground for an intrigue. Because intrigues don't appear out of nowhere, they need some watering to take place. And just like crops, there might be a lot of things that can wither them away before they will even manage to reach any point of being able to influence anything. For intrigues to even form, you need some kind of structure or hierarchy. This can be within an organization, a faction, or just in a political entity like a nation or a kingdom. But there's always something to be gained from intrigues. Power, control, or resources. Now, power and control might seem like the same thing, and they often are, but not always. Let's say you have a nomadic tribe that travels a lot. And let's say a certain group of people wants the current supply master to be changed to someone else. Well, this plot does not really gain any power, because the tribe leadership is still intact, and in any moment, they can reverse the outcome of your plot if they discover it or just find inconvenient, even after you succeed. But thanks to that plot, by putting someone from your own allies as a supply master, you now gain resources that can be allocated to you and control over the flow of resources to other tribesmen. But you didn't gain power, as this position can be overthrown at any moment by the tribe leader. Of course, by gaining something, I also mean not losing. An intrigue can be also formed as a way to prevent some kind of losses, replacing an incompetent general that have no idea about strategy but is too high up. It's, for example, a son of an influential noble, so we cannot do that the official way. So we form an intrigue to replace him with someone more fit for the position. We didn't gain anything from that, but at least we stopped losing every battle in this war. One of the biggest things that you need to watch out for, especially if you want to write a lot more political plots in your story, is the overall political environment. Even if there is something big to be gained, you need to remember that if there is a status quo where all political entities are at least fine with the current situation, they will not want to destabilize it. It will be much more difficult to find people who want to join an intrigue that could destabilize the overall power structure. Because remember, not everyone wants total chaos all the time and wants to gain power at all costs. Disturbing the status quo can lead to a lot of consequences that you just simply cannot predict. Just look like one assassination plot in our world led to World War I, which then led to rise of totalitarian regimes, which then led to the horrors of World War II, which then led to the Cold War. All of these massive events mentioned happened because of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, which disturbed the delicate balance of the status quo at that time. 
Most stable political environments are made out of people who, even if they don't really like the current status that much, they will need much convincing to even attempt to change it. Usually the start of an intrigue is initiated to make big gains without destabilizing a status quo. If the status quo is already in shambles, then it is much easier to set an intrigue in motion. But before it even starts properly, you need to first analyze the situation to see what are the possibilities and what tools you have to achieve whatever you want to achieve with your intrigue. After that, there is the most time-consuming and boring part of the intrigue, which is finding allies and making promises. You need to be very careful who do you approach. If you are not sure if someone could be an ally or a part of the intrigue that you're making, but that person is so powerful that, you know, it cannot be ignored. Maybe you probe that person to see where they stand on without revealing yourself too much. This is a dangerous task because you can show your hand to other people and if you find someone who is clever, they can see through you and your intrigue. In the meantime, you can throw red herrings to your opposition or to the people that might oppose you or suspect you. This is a step in every intrigue that lasts till the very moment of its execution. If your intrigue is strong enough, you may go for the next step, which is setting up. The setup is the most vulnerable part of the intrigue because now you make real attempts and actual moves to your goal. You set up people, you start bribes, maybe delivering some shady supplies and doing something that can be detected. From the moment you set up your intrigue in motion to the moment of its actual execution, your intrigue is the easiest to detect and actually fight against. Real moves and physical setup can be discovered by someone. The wider the setup and the more things you need to do to prepare, the more likely you are that you know an accident or something unsuspected will happen. You can calculate like this. The more things need to be moved around and the more time it takes, the more likely it is to be discovered. There is this great real life story about a mercenary called Simon Mann. Simon Mann had a private military company that was tasked to overthrow the ruler of Equatorial Guinea. He got the job from an outside party, but the entire setup for this intrigue was far too long and too many people were involved. It took a year between starting to set up this plan to actual execution, and there were too many people involved, so the plan leaked out and countermeasures were made. Simon Mann and his PMC didn't even manage to get to Equatorial Guinea because the plot that he was taking the part of was so exposed that almost everyone in power knew about it at this point and he was arrested in Zimbabwe when he was landing to gather some supplies on the way to Equatorial Guinea. There was too many people involved and it took far too long for this intrigue, so it failed. And of course, the last part of the intrigue is the execution. Trying to find out the perfect moment is extremely difficult, especially that intrigues rarely have enough information to make that decision properly. In the moment of execution, a lot of things can go wrong. Of course, the bigger the attempt, the bigger the risks involved, but you can absolutely write a much smaller stake intrigue. Maybe you want to write a story in a western saloon where one of the people who is working in the saloon wants to replace the chef of the kitchen, right? What's the worst that can happen if he fails? Well, he can lose his job, maybe, that that's, you know, and he will get reprimanded. Because the consequences are very low, the entire web and subterfuge of the intrigue does not need to be so grandiose. As for the common mistakes, well, there is quite a lot. The biggest one that very often appear in media are one dimensionality, showing an intrigue as if made by a hive mind. Everyone act as one and everyone is dedicated like if they are brainwashed. You need to remember that intrigues are rarely formed with such a one-minded goal. You need people for intrigues and with all things where people are a part of, there will always be unexpected things happening. What if there is a coward? Someone caught cold feet and just spoiled the intrigue to a person that it was not supposed to know about it. What if someone break under pressure or stress? What if someone is not dedicated that much, 
someone that was just bribed and then forgotten. Especially if you include the work of everyday common people to a high political intrigue, this can very quickly compromise it. Another one, which you probably see it coming, is open code names and too much symbolism. When your intrigue plot have agents that are named after a, I don't know, Latin name, and the faction taking part of this intrigue is called something like, I don't know, the New Order, you know it will not be a deep, nuanced story. Remember that symbolism and specific names helps to identify, and identification works against a secretive plot. The more camouflaged the plot is, the harder to spot it. Code names or symbolism should be shrouded within context of the organization you are working on. For example, during World War I, when the British were deploying tanks, they used the code name tanks, as if tanks of water and supplies, to hide the fact that they are moving experimental weapons through their supply lines, so that no one knew what really was transported. Which made sense. A tank is something that is common and normal to transport through a supply line during a war, you know, nothing unusual. And that was a part of a plot to surprise the Germans. Another thing that people tend to forget is counterintelligence. It is actually very, very rare to see a intrigue plot in a story which include a competent counterintelligence force. It does not need to be CIA, but even a fantasy kingdom court should have spy masters that are working for and not against the crown. Because in those rare occasions where there is a spy master in a story, then it's very often the traitor. That is why I always found the plot in Dishonored a bit strange, where people that are already in power are risking quite a lot to gain slightly more power, even though the current status quo was very much beneficial for them. In summary, you need to remember that personal interest and personal motivation plays very big roles in each intrigue, because an intrigue can make or break depending on those things, on those human factors. Sometimes an intrigue failing can also create a power vacuum. So, you know, maybe after an intrigue failing, there will be a couple of people, you know, in big places that will be discharged from their seat of power. And, you know, politics hate vacuum, and power vacuum always creates chaos that fills it. But that is all for today. I hope that you found value in this video, and it will help you write better stories. If you enjoyed it, and if you want to see other guides like this one, you can check one of those videos, or subscribe to my channel to see more. And yeah, I hope that you will have a great day, and you need to always remember that you are just one page, one chapter away from writing a great story. Have a great day.